Shamanic Nietzsche. God said to Nietzsche, that old teacher, you irritating little creature. Anonymous Graffito. Will Christendom ever reap the whirlwind it has sown? That it should try to pass without the vulnerability of interval, from a tyranny to a joke, is certainly understandable. But that its enemy should do nothing to obstruct its evasion of nemesis is more puzzling. How can there be such indifference to the decline of our inquisitors? Is it that they succeed so exorbitantly in their project of domestication that we have been robbed of every impulse to bite back? Having at last escaped from the torture palace of authoritarian love, we shuffle about, numb and confused, flinching from the twisted septic wound of our past, now clumsily bandaged with the rags of secular culture. It is painfully evident that post-Christian humanity is a pack of broken dogs. Georges Bataille is the preeminent textual impediment to Christianity's carefully plotted quiet death, the prolongation of its terminal agonies into the 20th century. Having definitively exhausted itself after two ugly millennia of species vivisection, Christianity attempts to skulk away from the scene, aided by the fog of supine tolerance, which dignifies itself as post-modernity. It does not take a genius to see whose interests are served by this passage, from Millicent theism to postmodern ambivalence. A despot abandons any game that begins to turn out badly. This has been the case with metaphysics. From Kant onwards, exploratory philosophy ceased to generate the outcomes favourable to established theistic power, and we were suddenly told, this game is over. Let's call it a draw. The authoritarian tradition of European reason tried to pull the plug on the great voyages at exactly the point they first became interesting, which is to say, atheistic, inhuman, experimental, and dangerous. Schopenhauer, refusing the agnostic standoff of antinomy, was the first rallying zone for all those disgusted by the contrived piece entitled The End of Metaphysics. Bataille is his most recent successor. The forces of Antichrist are emerging fanged and encouraged from their scorched rat holes in the wake of monotheistic hegemony, without the slightest attachment to the paralytic tinkerings of deconstructive undecidability. An attitude which is neither military nor religious becomes insupportable in principle from the moment of death's arrival. The war has scarcely begun. It is hard to imagine anything more ludicrous than Descartes or Kant having erected their humble philosophical dwellings alongside the Baroque architectural excesses of the church, standing in the shadows of flying buttresses and asking pompously, how do we know the truth? It surely cannot solely be due to Nietzsche that we see the absurdity of an epistemological question being asked in such surroundings. When a philosopher has a priest for a neighbour, which is to say a practitioner of the most elaborately constructed system of mendacity ever conceived upon earth, how can a commitment to truth in a positive sense even be under consideration? Truth in such situations is a privilege of the deaf. There is no question of error, weakness in reasoning, or mistaken judgment when addressing the authoritative discourses on truth in the Western tradition, those cathedrals of theological concept building that ground our common sense. No, here one can only speak of a deeply rooted and fanatical discipline of lying. In other words, one fraction of the radicality of the atheistic thinking escalated through Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and Bataille is that it overthrows the high bourgeois apologetic epistemological problematic in modern philosophy by asking clearly for the first time, where do the lies stop? The great educational value of the war against Christendom lies in the absolute truthlessness of the priest. Such purity is rare enough. The man of God is entirely incapable of honesty, and only arises at the point where truth is defaced beyond all legibility. Lies are his entire metabolism, the air he breathes, his bread and his wine. He cannot comment upon the weather without a secret agenda of deceit. No word, gesture or perception is slight enough to escape his extravagant reflex of falsification, and of the lies in circulation he will instinctively seize on the grossest, the most obscene and oppressive travesty. Any proposition passing the lips of a priest is necessarily totally false, excepting only insidious ease whose message is momentarily misunderstood. 
It is impossible to deny him without discovering some buried fragment or reality. There is no truth that is not war against theology, and even the word truth has been plastered by the spittle of priestcraft. It cannot be attachment to some alternative conviction that cuts here, but only relentless refusal of what has been told. The dangerous infidels bypass dialectics. It is the skeptic who assassinates the lie. Whenever its name has been anything but a jest, philosophy has been haunted by a subterranean question. What if knowledge were a means to deepen unknowing? It is this thought alone that has differentiated it from the shallow things of the earth, yet the glory, and also the indignity of philosophy, is to have sought the end of knowing, and no more. Once blatant sophisms are exempted, the fact that scepticism has never been enacted is the sole argument of the dogmatists, and it is a powerful one, despite its empirical flavour. There can be little doubt that the philosophical advocates of disbelief have tended to exploit the very conventions they profess to despise as the shelter for an insincere madness. As was the case with Socrates, philosophy has sought to peel itself away from sophism by admitting to its ignorance, as if unknowing were a pathos to be confessed. Profound exanity, exane, out of one's mind, alone is effective scepticism, in comparison to which sceptical philosophies fall prey to naive theories of belief, as if belief could simply be discarded or withheld. We know nothing, of course, but we do not remotely know even this, and mere assertion in no way ameliorates our destitution. Belief is not a possession, but a prison, and we continue to believe and achieve knowledge even after denying it with intellectual comprehensiveness. The refusal to accept a dungeon is no substitute for a hole in the wall. Only in a voyage to the unknown is there real escape from conviction. The dangerous sceptics are those can't fears, a species of nomads despising all settled modes of life, who come from a wilderness tract beyond knowledge. They are explorers, which is also to say invasion routes of the unknown. It is by way of these inhumanists that the vast abrupt of shamanic zero the epochy of the ancients, infiltrates its contagious madness onto the earth. Epochy is a word attributed to Pyrrho by way of indirect reportage, but in its absence the philosopher's name would lose what slight sense invests it. Although it might be argued that we owe epochy to Pyrrho, it is from epochy that the name Pyrrho comes to us as a cryptograph of the unknown. Even were it not for Pyrrho's silence, a silence far more profound than the literary abstinence of Socrates, epochy would surely not be something of which we could straightforwardly know the truth, far less a method or a subjective state. Epochy is a report of the abrupt and an escape. 1. 2. The world of phenomena is the adapted world which we feel to be real. The reality lies in the continual recurrence of identical, familiar, related things in their logicized character, in the belief that here we are able to reckon and calculate. 3. The antithesis of this phenomenal world is not the true world, but the formless, unformulable world of the chaos of sensations, another kind of phenomenal world, a kind unknowable for us. 4. Questions, what things in themselves may be like apart from our sense, receptivity, and the activity of our understanding, must be rebutted with the question, how could we know that things exist? Thingness was first created by us. The question is whether there could not be many other ways of creating such an apparent world. How much industrialism lies buried in the notion of thought, as if one could ever work things out? One does not think one's way out. One gets out, and then sees that... It wasn't one. Bataille's Nietzsche is not a locus of secular reason, but of shamanic religion, a writer who escapes philosophical conceptuality in the direction of ulterior zones and dispenses with the thing in itself because it is an item of intelligible representation with no consequence as a vector of becoming, of travel. Shamanism defies the transcendence of death, opening the tracts of voyages of discovery never reported. Against the grain of shallow phenomenalism that characterizes Nietzsche readings, Bataille pursues the fissure of abysmal scepticism, which passes out of the Kantian noumenon, or intelligible object, through Kant and Schopenhauer's thing in itself, stripping away a layer of residual Platonism, and onwards in the direction of a categorical, 
epochal or base matter that connects with Rambo's invisible splendors. The immense deathscapes of a universe without images. Matter cannot be allotted a category without being retrieved for ideality, and the Nietzschean problem with the Ding and Sikh was not its supposed dogmatic materialism, but rather that it proposed an ideal form of matter, as the transcendent, quarantined site of integral truth, a real world. There are no things in themselves, because there are no things. Thingness has only been invented by us owing to the requirements of logic which ultimately revert to those of grammar. The Ding an sich is a concept tailored for a god, supreme being, desperately seeking to hide itself, a cultural glitch turned nasty, but on the run at last. Root of the idea of substance in language, not in beings outside us. The antithesis of the apparent world and the true world is reduced to the antithesis world and nothing. Materialism is not a doctrine but an expedition, an alpine breakout from socially policed conviction. It is before anything else the obstinate negation of idealism, which is to say of the very basis of all philosophy. Exploring a categorical matter navigates thought as chance and matter as turbulence, beyond all regulation. It yields no propositions to judge, but only paths to explore. This is Nietzsche as a fanged poet at war with the philosophers, with the new priests, a thinker who seeks to make life more problematic. Bataille locks onto a desire that resonates with the reality that confounds us, and not with a rationality that would extricate us from the labyrinth. Nietzsche is the great exemplar of complicating thought, exploiting knowledge in the interest of interrogations, and this is not in order to clarify and focus, but to subtilize and dissociate them. Complicating thought strengthens the impetus of an active or energetic confusion, delirium, against the reactive forces whose obsessive tendency is to resolve or conclude. Rebelling against the fundamental drift of philosophical reasoning, it sides with thought against knowledge, against the tranquilizing prescriptions of the will to truth. If Nietzsche is locked in an extraordinarily furious struggle with philosophy, it is because it is philosophy that has claimed, with the most cynical explicitness, to negate problems. Philosophy has always wanted to retire. Schopenhauer is simply its most honest exemplar. The absolute is humanity's laziest thought, nor does it suffice to argue that thought can be complicated within itself, or, as the philosophers have said for some time, imminently, for we know where this path of thinking leads. An intellection in need of imminent critique is one that is already nudging against an ultimate solubility. The intellect finds its limits within itself. It does not even need to move to consummate interrogation. It is thinking such as this, whose most eminent model is the cant of the critical philosophy, that generated such distrust in Nietzsche for writers who work sitting down. Wisdom, Sophia, substitutes for travelling, hollowing it out into a Baudelairean caricature of the voyage, redundantly reiterating a moral dogma, and to love it is to seek to be still. In obedience to narco-platonic eros, philosophy defers to the end of desire. Nietzsche reaches back beyond this Hellenic priest philosophizing and forward beyond its modern limit, resembling Sophia as escape. Indeed, we philosophers and free spirits feel, when we hear the news that the old god is dead, as if a new dawn shone on us. Our heart overflows with gratitude, amazement, premonitions, expectations. At long last, the horizon appears free to us again, even if it should not be bright. At long last, our ships may venture out again, venture out to face any danger. All the daring of the lover of knowledge is permitted again. The sea, our sea, lies open again. Perhaps there has never yet been such an open sea. The death of God is an opportunity, a chance. It makes sense to ask what is meant by the word noumenon, but chance does not function in this way, since it is not a concept to be apprehended, but a direction in which to go. To the one who grasps what chance is, how insipid the idea of God appears, and suspicious, and wing-clipping. Monotheism is the great gatekeeper, 
and where it ends, the exploration of death begins. If there are places to which we are forbidden to go, it is because they can in truth be reached, or because they can reach us. In the end, poetry is invasion and not expression, a trajectory of incineration, either strung up in the cobwebs of paradise or strung out into the shadow torrents of hell. It is a root out of creation, which is to each their fate interpreted as enigma, as lure. Now a hard and inexorable voyage commences, a quest into the greatest possible distance. I said goodbye to the world, even the most angelic curiosity, when multiplied to the power of eternity, must find its way to end in the abyss. It can seem at times as if Bataille owes almost everything to Christianity, his understanding of the evil at the heart of erotic love, the hysterical affectivity of his writing, along with its excremental obsession, its epileptoid conception of delight, its malignancy, the perpetual stench of the gutter. Yes, this is all very Christian, well attuned to a doctrine just stated in the sewers of the empire. Yet from out of the aberrant intensity and disorder of Bataille's writings, an impossible proposition is perpetually reiterated. That far from being the acme of religion, let alone its telic blossoming, God is the principle of its suppression. The unity of Theos is the tombstone of sacred zero, the crumbling granitic foundation of secular destitution. This is so exorbitantly true that the existence of God would be an even greater disaster for him than for us. How infinitely trivial the crucifixion of Jesus appears beside the degrading torture of being God. After all, existence is so indistinguishable from defilement that one turns pale at the very thought of an eternal being's smell. Perhaps this is why God is profoundly atheistic, leading Bataille to remark that, whilst I am God, I deny him to the depths of negation. Nihilism might be a divine way of thinking, Nietzsche anticipates. God can only redeem the universe from its civility by burning his creation to ash and annihilating himself. Such is the God of blinding sun, this God of death that I sought. But I invokes the dark undertow of a self-butchering divinity. God of despair, give me your heart which no longer tolerates you to exist. If God is an explorer, then there is no God. Bataille's texts are a hecatomb of words without gods or reason to be, led back down through the crypts of the West by a furious impulse to dissociate theism and religion, and thus to return the sacred to its shamanic impiety, except that nothing can ever simply return, and hell will never be an innocent underworld again. The depths have become infernal, really so, quite irrespective of the fairy tales we are still told. Flames surround us, the abyss opens beneath our feet, reports Bataille from the brink of the impossible. An abyss that does not end in the satiate contemplation of an absence, because its lip is the charred ruin of even the most sublime subjectivity. I have nothing to do in this world, he writes, if not to burn. I suffer from not burning, approaching so close to death that I respire it like the breath of a lover. It is not only due to the Inquisition that all the great voyages have for a long time been singed. For well over a century, all who have wanted to see have seen. No profound exploration can be launched from the ruins of monotheism unless it draws its resources from damnation. The death of God is a religious event, a transgression, experiment in damnation, and stroke of anti-theistic warfare. But this is not to say it is preeminently a crime. Hell has no interest in our debauched moral currency. To confuse reactive dabblings in sin with expeditions in damnation is Christian superficiality. The Dantean error of imagining that one could earn oneself an excursion in hell, as if the infernal too was a matter of justice. Our crimes are mere stumblings on the path to ruin, just as every projected hell on earth is a strict exemplar of idolatry. Transgression is not criminal action, but tragic fate, the intersection of an economically programmed apocalypse with the religious antihistory of poetry. It is the inevitable occurrence of impossibility, which is not the same as death, 
but neither is it essentially different. This ambivalence responds to that of death itself, which is not ontological, but labyrinthine, a relapse of composition that is absolute to discontinuity, yet is nothing at the level of imminence. The very individuality that would condition the possibility of a proprietary death could only be achieved if death were impossible. One dies because discontinuity is never realized, but this means that there is never one who dies. Instead, there is an unthinkable communication with zero, imminence, or the sacred. There is no feeling that throws one into exuberance with greater force than that of nothingness. But exuberance is not at all annihilation. It is the surpassing of the shattered attitude. It is transgression. The question of the mere truth of Christianity, whether in regard of its origin, not to speak of Christian astronomy and natural science, is a matter of secondary importance as long as the question of the value of Christian morality is not considered. What if eternal recurrence were not a belief? The most extreme form of nihilism would be the view that every belief is necessarily false because there simply is no true world. But I suggests, the return emotivates the instant, freeing life from an end and in this ruining it straight away. The return is the desert of one for whom each instant henceforth finds itself emotivated. Christianity, the exemplary moral religion, substituted slow suicide and representation, belief, for shamanic contact with zero interruption, but with the re-emergence of nihilistic recurrence, caution, prudence, every kind of concern for time to come is restored to the senselessness of cosmic noise. With recurrence comes a future, which is not the prolongation of myself across time, but the expiry of a being going further, passing attained limits. A religious crisis can no longer be deferred. In the final phase of Nietzsche's intellectual life, the eternal recurrence is grasped as a weapon, a hammer, the transmission element between diagnosis and intervention. Where Christendom recuperates decline to preservation, deflecting it from its intensive plummet to zero, eternal recurrence reopens its abyssal prospect, precipicing affect onto death. This is the predominant sense of selection in Nietzsche's texts, a vertiginous extrication of zero from the series of preservative values, cutting through the ambiguous and cowardly compromise of a religion such as Christianity, more precisely such as the Church, which instead of encouraging death and self-destruction, protects everything ill-constituted and sick, and makes it propagate itself. The notes assembled into section 55 of The Will to Power develop this morbid thread. Either existence as it is, without meaning or aim, yet recurring inevitably without any finale of nothingness, a box, or the nothing, the meaningless, eternally. The nihilism of recurrence is ambivalent between its Christian historical sense as the constrictive deceleration of zero and its cosmic, non-local, virtuality as a gateway onto death. Christendom is to be attacked because it was its morality that protected life against despair and the leap into nothing. Morality guarded the underprivileged against nihilism, supposing that the faith in this morality would perish, then the underprivileged would no longer have their comfort and they would perish. The religious history of mankind is based upon a technics of ill health, dehydration, starvation, mutilation, deprivation of sleep, a general self-destruction of the underprivileged, self-vivisection, poisoning, intoxication. A journey was underway which Christian preservative moralism generalized species cowardice, privatized, representationalized, crushed under the transcendent phallus, froze, obstructed, and drove elsewhere. Christianity is a device for trapping the sick, but recurrence melts through the cages. What does underprivileged mean, above all, physiologically, no longer politically? The unhealthiest kind, in all classes, furnishes the soil for this nihilism. They will experience the belief in the eternal recurrence as a curse, struck by which one no longer shrinks from any action not to be extinguished, but to extinguish everything. To relate sickness to death as cause to effect is itself a sign of health. Their morbid interconnection is quite different. Sickness is not followed by death within the series of ordered representation. It opens the gates. 
Genealogy does not reduce sickness to a historical topic, since sickness, the inability to suspend a stimulus, eludes mere unfolding in progressive time, tending towards the disappearance of time in an epochal interruption. The reflex spasm at, and by which, reactivity gropes, is the atemporal continuum beneath the crust of health. Death is that which has no history, and Nietzsche's method is syphilis. Only religion assures a consumption that destroys the proper substance of those that it animates. Philosophy is a ghoul that haunts only ruins, and the broken croaks of our hymns to sickness have scarcely begun. Borne by currents of deep exhaustion that flow silent and inexorable beneath the surface perturbations of twitch and chatter, damned, shivering, claw-like fingers hewn from torture and sunk into wreckage drawn with unbearable slowness down the maw of flame and snuffed blackness twisted skewerish into fever-hollowed eyes. Eternal recurrence is our extermination, and we cling to it as infants to their mother's breasts. Poetry leads from the known to the unknown, writes Bataille, in words that resonate with Rambeau. Poetry is fluent silence, the only venture of writing to touch upon the sacred, equals zero, because the unknown is not distinguished from nothingness by anything that discourse can announce. To write the edge of the impossible is a transgression against discursive order and an incitement to the unspeakable. Poetry is immoral. Rambo writes from the other side of Zarathustrian descent, death, Untergang, anticipating the labyrinthine spaces of a Nietzsche for the sick and of what escapes from due to the cultural convulsion that Nietzsche reinforces. The poet makes himself a visionary by a long, immense and rational deregulation of all the senses, and this deregulation is a source of ineffable torture. The sufferings are enormous, Rambo insists. No organism is adapted to arrive at the unknown, which makes deregulation as necessary as it makes pain inevitable. Our nerves squeal when they are re-strung upon the phylogenetically unanticipated. Experiences strike too deeply. Memory becomes a festering wound, a descent into the inferno. Nuit de l'enfer, where the entrails of nature dissolve meanderous into lava. This is hell, eternal pain. And Rambo burns, as is necessary. Yes, the poet must be a visionary. The East knows a true lucidity, but to be an inheritor of the West is to hack through jungles of indiscipline, devoured by violence and words unstrung from sense, until the dripping foliage of delirium opens out onto a space of comprehensive ruin. This has never been understood, nor can it be. The foulness of our fate only deepens with the centuries, as the tracts of insanity sprawl. From bodies gnawed by tropical fevers, we swim out through collapse to inexistence in forever, destined for undo. True poetry is hideous because it is base communication, in contrast to pseudo-communicative discourse, which presupposes the isolation of the terms it unites. Communication, in the transgressive nonsense Bataille lends it, is both an utter risk and an unfathomable degradation associated with repellent affect. The ego emerges in the flight from communicative imminence, from deep or unholy community, initiating a history that leads to the bitter truth of the desertification of the isolated being. From the anxiety of base contact, which you can only experience as dissolution, the ego stumbles into the ennui of autonomy, the antechamber to a harsh despair, whose horror is accentuated by the fact that it arises at the point where escape has exhausted itself, where the ego has quarantined itself to the limit of its being against extraneous misfortune. Ennui is not any sort of response to the compromising of the ego from without. It is not an impurity or a contamination. The negation of such things are, for it, a condition of existence. But rather, it is the very truth of achieved being, the core affect of personal individuality. Ennui cannot be mastered, surpassed, resolved, aufgehoben, because it is nothing but the distillate of such operations, indeed, of action as such. Ennui is insinuated into the very fabric of project as the necessity of leaving oneself. If the soil of Bataille's writing is volcanic, it is not only due to the sporadic convulsions of a devastating incandescence, 
but also because its fertility is anticipated by a monstrous sterilization. Beneath and before the luxuriant jungles of delirium is the endless crushing ash plain of despair. I believe that I am in hell. Therefore, I am there. Blake might have written such words, although their sense would then have been quite different. Drooled from Rambo's pen, they point less to a potency of imagination than to a geological crisis of justification, approaching a perfect epistemological irresponsibility. It is not for us to defend the rights of truth. Truth is decreed by the masters. What matters is to adapt, nursing the meagre resources of our reactivity, of our base cunning. Belief, the cloak of confession, is too precious a resource to be squandered on the zealotry of idealism. What value is there to be extracted from a committed belief, from a last-ditch belief? Such things are for the strong, or for dupes, for the allies and slaves of light, and for all those who do not rely on the subterranean passages beneath belief to avoid the panoptic apparatuses. Adaptability can only be lamed by commitments. We have seen enough true Christians, rabbits transfixed by headlights. When draped about the inferiors, beliefs are not loyalties, but rather sunblocks against inquisition. We creatures of shadow are hidden from their enlightenment. We believe exactly what they want. The inferior race await God with greed, scavenging at Christ like wolves at an animal they have not killed. Creation, testamental genealogy, the passion of Christ. None of it is their story, nor is any other for they are too indolent to have a story of their own. Only theft and lies are proper to them. Pillage. Rambo's inheritance, above all, consists of mendacity and sloth. I have never been a Christian. I am of the race which sung under torture, he remarks. It is precisely obliviousness to Christianity, to fidelity or duty, to privileged narratives, that eases the inferior race into singing the praises of the Nazarene. The white man has guns, Therefore, the truth. The whites disembark. The cannon. It is necessary to submit to baptism. Dress oneself. Work. In contrast to the pompous declarations of the orthodoxies, which come from on high, like a stroke of the whip, an infernal message is subterranean, a whisper from the nether regions of discourse, since hell is certainly below. Just as the underworld is not a hidden world, a real or true, wahre Welt, but is that hidden by all worlds, so is the crypt mutter from hell something other than an inverted scene, concept, or belief. In their infernal lineaments, words are passages, leading into and through lost mazes, and not edifications. Acquisition is impossible in hell. There is nothing en bas except wandering amongst emergences, and what is available has always come strangely without belonging. Infernal lowlife has no understanding for property. Even the thoughts of the inferior ones are camouflage and dissimulation, their beliefs mere chameleon dapplings of the skin. Poetry does not strut logically amongst convictions. It seeps through crevices, a magmic flux resuscitated amongst vermin. If it was not that the great ideas had basements, fissures, and vacuoles, Poetry would never infest them. Faiths rise and fall, but the rats persist. Rambo's saison en en fait pulsates through a discourse without integrity. Teaching nothing, it infects. Like matter cooked through with pestilential contagions of energy, it collapses into a swarm of plague vectors. Substance is only its host. Words, books, monuments, symbols, and laughters are nothing but the paths of this contagion, its passages. I never could conclude anything. Zero does that. Towards new seas, that way is my will. I trust in my mind and in my grip. Without plan, into the vast open sea I head my ship. All is shining, new and newer. Upon space and time sleeps noon. Only your eye, monstrously, stares at me. Infinity. <laughs>